So as the 1950s start, it seems like the French and Germans own modern music due to their lock on music concrete. Or do they? In 1951, our good friend John Cage found something he calls the Project of Music for Magnetic Tape. And they're involved in doing all sorts of things like rolling dice and coming up with different random ways to cut up all different kinds of tapes and splice them together to make pieces out of. Interesting stuff. There's also something happening over at Columbia. There are these two students, Otto Luning and Vladimir Usachevsky, and they start playing around with the tape recorders that they've got at Columbia and start working on this stuff that they keep hearing about, this music concrete. Their first batch of pieces consists all of recorded sounds, no electronics at all. Why? They didn't have any. They didn't have a sine wave generator, so they turned to the closest thing they could come to, which is the flute an instrument which produces the closest thing to a sine wave we have. Some of their pieces had 12-tone structures, and they built all this stuff laboriously, somewhat like Stockhausen did, using their few tape recorders and their flute as a crude sine wave oscillator. All they had were two tape machines, one microphone, a few cables, and some other bits and pieces. Like most college students, they like to talk themselves up a little bit bigger than they were, and they managed to get themselves booked to play at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But there was only one problem. They hadn't finished any pieces yet. They scrambled around and managed to compose a few pieces in time for the show, and attracted so much attention and so much fame that they were sort of the uh, people who were designated to lead the flag of music concrete and modern electronic music in the United States. And using this, three years later, they were able to get a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. And this grant was to be used to start an electronic music studio. In 1957, they write a 155-page document that serves as a report urging everyone to create a truly American studio for electronic music. It's around this time they hook up with a fellow named Milton Babbitt and his buddy Roger Sessions. These guys are at Princeton, and they, together they start the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center. And in 1957, it purchases the RCA Mark I synthesizer and subsequently will acquire the Mark II. Americans with the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center are finally getting into modern music in a big way. But what about this RCA synthesizer? Well, RCA didn't just make electronics, they were also a record company. And the biggest expense they had was hiring orchestras to play the pieces that they were recording. Whether it was for pop music or classical music, orchestras cost a lot. You need a lot of very trained musicians who mostly have to sit around all day while people fiddle with microphones and things like that. So, the geniuses over at RCA say, well, can't we just make a machine that would kind of crank this stuff out? Then we wouldn't have to hire all these people. We'd save a bundle. Whatever, cost, whatever it would cost us, we'll make it back. The results of this are the RCA Mark I electronic music synthesizer. It's the first truly modern synthesizer in that it was modular, meaning that it was composed of different little pieces that you could connect together in different ways. And it could generate, modify, process, record, and present complex sounds. It allowed you complete control over the duration of a sound. You could set a particular attack, so a slow attack, which starts off very quiet and gets louder slowly, or a quick attack, which starts off loud right away. You could control the decay, the sustain, and the release. You could also completely control the pitch and the volume of these sounds, as well as the timbre. It also had a way that you could store musical instructions, and it allowed for editing of those instructions. This enabled one to do really complicated 12-tone or serialist type stuff and make the computer or calculator part of this thing do all the hard work. This was a godsend for composers working in this style. There were a few limitations, however. The synthesizer used tuning forks for oscillators. Now, tuning forks are fixed things. They only vibrate at certain pitches. And this meant, unfortunately, that this very powerful synthesizer was locked into producing 12 notes per octave. It couldn't do microtunings. It could also generate white noise. It had some filters built in. It had recording that let you cut your music directly to record. And it also let you play two notes at a time. It was duophonic. It worked something like a modern spreadsheet, where you had 36 parameters per sound. So you would have these giant columns. So for your first note, you had 36 different things you had to set. What pitch did you want? What sound did you want? How long did you want it to go on? How long did you want it to take it to get to its maximum volume? And so forth. 
it was very difficult to work this way because for every single note, you had to enter all of these parameters. You could also plug a microphone in and use the synthesizer's filters and other things to process the sound that you fed into it. Well, Milton Babbitt was fascinated with this machine and started cranking out lots of pieces. Some of these pieces were designed to be listened to on their own, and some were designed to be played with orchestras. The stuff he was turning out was much more mainstream than John Cage and his wacko people, but it allowed for people to get interested in this stuff without scaring them away or threatening them too much. The vastly improved Mark II is finished in 1957, and Babbitt manages to convince the people that run the Columbia Princeton Electronic Music Center to buy it in 1959. Babbitt then devotes himself to mastering its absolutely horrible user interface. The Mark II synthesizer was a behemoth that contained 750 vacuum tubes and completely covered a single wall. It was enormous and hot. It read punched paper tape and used those instructions to control an analog synthesizer. Metal brushes either made contact or didn't through the punched paper tape, and depending on how it made contact, music came out. You used a sort of typewriter, you fed the paper in and punched holes in it to make your music. Well, you didn't. Almost nobody did, except for Milton Babbitt, because it wasn't much fun sitting in this little tiny hot room, pecking away on this mysterious keyboard to try and create music. Like the Mark I, the Mark II had been developed to crank out pop music and traditional classical recordings. We're very fortunate that Usachevsky and his buddy Luning saw the potential of these machines and pushed the, the Columbia Princeton Music Studio in the direction of avant-garde and modern music. Now, around this time in 1957 at Bell Labs in New Jersey, there are some very interesting things going on. There's a guy there named Max Matthews. And he's very interested in music, so he's pushing his research in that direction. The head of his department is also interested in sound synthesis, and together they begin making music with computers. This happens because Matthews is interested in coming up with a computer tool for music. So he starts writing a computer program. He makes several iterations of it, calling each one Music 1, Music 2, Music 3, and so on. By the time he gets to Music 5, this program is hierarchical and it allows you to simulate oscillators, mixers, amplifiers, and other modules. The only problem was it took weeks to hear what you were doing because you would take these punch cards, feed them in the computer, and it would spit out something. Then you'd have to take that, feed it into another computer, which would turn it back into sound. So you couldn't hear what you were working on while you were working on it. Now, Matthews isn't much of a composer, so he does what any sensible person would do. He goes out and hires a composer. And for seven years, from 1959 to 1966, Bell Labs has a composer in residence whose only job is to work with this tool and make computer music. Matthews also demonstrates something he calls a digital to analog converter. The goal of this project is to figure out a way to synthesize voices on the telephone using a computer. In this way, they could get rid of all the operators that they had to hire to take information and answer people's requests. In 1963, Matthews publishes an article in Science Magazine called The Digital Computer as Musical Instrument. And this one article sets off a whole bunch of action. The French read it, they send over a researcher who decides that ultimately France has to have its own computer music center, and they set one up in 1977. It's called IRCOM. Schools all around the country begin setting up their own computer music departments, and musicians suddenly realize that now, to stay current and stay modern, they have to become computer programmers as well as musicians. Working with this Music 5 software, which Matthews and Bell Labs were giving away to universities that wanted it, any composer could use a computer at their school to compose a piece. The computer would then spit out a digital tape with the piece on it. Then you sent the tape over to Bell Labs. They took that digital tape and used this digital to analog converter and turned it into analog tape that could be played on a regular tape machine. This took about two weeks. So there was a two-week delay between you trying an idea and hearing what it actually sounded like. Computers were now being used to make music. This is one of the last, most final, exciting steps to happen to music in the 20th century.